In New Zealand politics, we tend to only remember the work done by the Prime Ministers, forgetting about the other hard-working politicians who have made New Zealand what it is today. A very important person in modern New Zealand politics is Winston Peters. To quote myself in a previous video, Peters is seen as a man of the people or a political supervillain, depending on who you ask. He is a very polarizing figure who has been in New Zealand Parliament for 36 years, the 8th longest serving MP in New Zealand history. This man has an insane history in modern New Zealand politics, being known as the Kingmaker. We have 36 years of New Zealand politics to cover, so buckle up, this is going to be a long video. I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. Come on. Okay, Boomer. We have the most enormously gay rainbow across my electorate. They're not going to win an election. Let's keep moving! Winston Peters was born in Whangarei, Northland, and married descendant on his mother's side. He became a lawyer by trade after graduating Auckland University in 1970, but his aspirations were for political office. His first election was as the national candidate for the Northern Maori electorate. The Maori electorates have never really seen strong candidates from that national party, but unsurprisingly he lost that election. But he did receive 1,873 votes in that election, being the first national MP in decades to get his deposit back in a Maori electorate. When you run in an electorate, you have to pay a fee or a deposit, and if you get enough votes, you get your deposit back. A way to disincentivize people for running in electorates who have no business running for office. This shows that Winston was different from your average national MP. He was charming and charismatic and could woo the disenfranchised voters who in the past did not usually vote for the national party. He seemed to have a vibe to him that he was just a regular guy fighting for the problems of the people, a real populist. His loss in 75 did not deter Peters from trying again. He ran for parliament again in 1978. This time he ran in the Hanua electorate against the Labour candidate Malcolm Douglas, who was actually the brother of Roger Douglas, the co-founder of the ACT Party and a very influential former former MP himself. Roger Douglas needs a video all to himself honestly. Anyway, back to the Hanua election. On election night, the votes were counted and Malcolm Douglas was victorious by 301 votes. But Winston Peters smelt something fishy and he took the case to court and actually won. The court threw out 500 belts due to voter irregularities and awarded Peters the seat in Parliament. Winston Peters fought his way into Parliament after the 78 election, winning a legal battle over voting irregularities. As he was a new MP, he did not receive any cabinet positions within Robert Muldoon's national-led government. I believe that when Peters has got what it takes, uh, and uh, that means that um, he does his homework, when he gets it clear in his mind, he says it, and that's important in politics. And uh, the people respond and they say, I like that bloke because he says what he thinks. But he did do this weirdly awkward interview with the National Deputy Prime Minister, Brian Talboys. Too few New Zealanders are aware of our country's new place in the world. Mr. Talboys, how is New Zealand's world role changing? The 1981 election rolled around and Winston Peters lost his seat to Labour's Colin Moyle. There was no court case for this one. He was out of parliament. But in 1984, he moved to Tauranga and ran as the national candidate for the Tauranga electorate. Winston Peters was a serial electorate switcher, constantly moving around to see who will elect him. This was a problem back in this time in the New Zealand elections, before we implemented the mixed member proportional voting system in 1994. MMP puts less weight on candidates winning electorates and allows parties to get seats based on the popular vote as well. But at this time, you could only become a member of parliament by winning an electorate seat. Peters actually won the Tauranga seat this time and would stay loyal to Tauranga for the next few decades. 1984 was not only the year that Winston returned to parliament, but it was the year that National lost the majority in government. We do not have a majority and we must thus have a general election and I propose to proceed to Government House now. Rob Muldoon's National Government was out, but Winston Peters' newly minted Tauranga MP was in with Labour's David Longy becoming the Prime Minister. As a backbencher in opposition, Winston stayed out of the limelight, but was known to occasionally publicly criticise his own party when he disagreed with the leadership. This was until 1986, when he exposed the Maori Loans Affair, a scandal in which the Maori Affairs Department was illegally raising funds from overseas investors. The national leadership quickly promoted Winston to the front bench of the opposition, where they made him the party's spokesperson for Maori Affairs, and also the spokesperson for employment and race relations. That year, Winston was re-elected to be Tauranga's MP, with 53% of the vote. Winston still publicly criticised the National Party leadership when he disagreed with them. Something very unusual for a front bencher. We had an unnecessary public squabble over the last few days, which was inconsistent with the best interests of the National Party. I'm going to do my best to ensure that the National Party is united and that it uh, works cohesively to victory. 
But the people saw it as refreshing, a politician who called it as he saw it, and didn't take crap from even his own party. The 1990 election rolled around, which saw a national sweep and majority of seats, allowing Winston's boss, Jim Bolgers, to become the Prime Minister. Winston received a thumping majority in Tauranga that year, getting 65% of the vote, and he received a position in Jim Bolger's cabinet, becoming the Minister of Maori Affairs. From that point on, Winston Peters sort of became a household name, being an MP that everyone could find charming and relatable, seeming like a true outsider in Parliament, seeming like a man of the people. He was even being seen on polls as a preferred Prime Minister, nipping at the heels of his boss, Jim Bolger's. This promotion of cabinet was short-lived though. Winston Peters would not tow the party line, being outspoken about his beliefs and even criticising the Prime Minister, the man he was supposed to work for and be loyal to. But Winston was not unpopular for this, even topping some polls as preferred Prime Minister at this time. Running neck and neck with high-flying opposition frontbencher Winston Peters in the preferred Prime Minister stakes. He constantly squabbled with his peers in the National Caucus, most notably Ruth Richardson, the National Finance Minister, as they both had vastly different views on how the government should spend its money. Richardson said publicly, maybe this is the opening round in the formation of a Win Peters party. But with the policies that he espouses, it will be a lose Peter's party. So in 1991, Prime Minister Jim Bolger fired Winston from cabinet for not being a team player. This would not be Winston's final sacking from government. He still retained his seat in Parliament, but Winston had been excommunicated from the leadership of the National Party, essentially declaring any aspirations that he had of being Prime Minister futile. During this time as a backbencher after his sacking, Peters made a lot of fuss about possible tax dodging undertaken by large New Zealand companies through the Cook Islands, but he did not have the sway in Parliament anymore to institute a Parliament inquiry into the matter. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. In 1992, as a lead up to the 1993 election, the National leadership was deciding on who they want to run in their electorates, and decided to bar Winston Peters from running in the Tauranga electorate as a national candidate, but it also turned out that Peters had signed a contract with the National Party that barred him from running in Tauranga for any other party. So according to this contract and National's choice to run a different candidate, Peters was unable to run in the 1993 election. So Peters did what he does best and challenged the contract in court. Okay. Put, 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 put. In this case, Peters versus Coolidge, it was ruled that the term barring from Winston running in the election was illegal as it restricted the democratic process in New Zealand. This is not whether Winston Peters wins or loses. It's about fundamental issues that go to the core and quality of democratic life in this country. This case is not only a very important part of New Zealand common law, but it was the last straw for Winston Peters. Just months before the 1993 election, Peters quit the National Party, causing a by-election to take place in Tauranga. Winston Peters received an insane 90.8% of the vote in that by-election. Democracy had a marvellous victory here in Tauranga today. As no other major party bothered to run a candidate in that race, as a real election would soon follow. This made Peters an independent MP, representing Tauranga for the few months before the real election. Peters started his own new party, New Zealand First. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take our country and our democracy back. And that is why this party, launched on this historic day, is called New Zealand First. Which was seen as a vaguely right-wing party, with not a lot of concrete policy proposals, as it was launched just before the election. The 1993 election rolled around, and Winston held on to Tauranga with 55% of the vote, beating out his replacement national candidate, John Cronin. New Zealand First won another seat in the Northern Maori electorate as well, which was a big surprise of the night, and this was used as evidence that New Zealand First was not just Winston Peters' party, but a real party that could win with other candidates. For three years, the New Zealand First party sat in opposition to the national government, led by Peters' old boss, Jim Bolgers. For three years, New Zealand First was seen as a confronting force. They will stand up for the people and stand up against the power of the national government. The biggest thing Winston did at this time was to continue to make claims about tax dodging in the Cook Islands, which he then went on to criticise the serious fraud office and inland revenue for corruption and serious incompetence over this matter. This is a very complicated scandal rooted in New Zealand tax law that is kind of hard to get your head around, so I'll try to give you the gist of what happened. Since Winston's original claims in 1992, a journalist, Ian Wishart, did extensive research into the supposed fraud that included very large New Zealand companies that were using loopholes in the New Zealand's tax system to funnel money into the Cook Islands to avoid paying certain income taxes. Through his research, this reporter came into possession of sensitive documents related to the case, and kept these documents in an old wine box. When he was ready to release his findings, there was a court injunction over sharing the material on TVNZ, so Wishart leaked the documents to Winston Peters. Peters being the legend that he is, strolled up to Parliament with the wine box in hand, full of documents, and forced a formal inquiry 
over this supposed fraud. This inquiry had a long and boring name, but everyone in New Zealand started calling it the Wine Box Inquiry. This scandal was huge in New Zealand and made Winston Peters seem like he was a hero of the people, bringing leaked documents to Parliament to stop large ministers from defrauding the country. The specifics of the case is not really important to understand, but the commission in charge of the inquiry ended up ruling that there was no fraud or incompetence. This was challenged in court again and again by Peters, but the ruling stood. But changes were made swiftly to the tax code, eliminating many of the loopholes used by these large companies. So you could say that Winston lost the inquiry, but stopped the fraud from occurring any further. This inquiry is very famous in New Zealand and got Winston Peters and New Zealand First a lot of buzz as a party that fights for the people. The 1996 election rolled around and New Zealand First and Winston had become more and more popular, mainly due to the Weinbox scandal. The 1996 election was also the first election to be done with a new MMP voting system, which had been chosen as a new voting system through various referendums a few years prior. This allowed voters to get two votes instead of just one, one for their local electorate and one for their favourite party, and seats will be delegated out in combination with both of these votes. MMP is still the voting system that we use today in New Zealand. This gave third parties more of a chance to get into Parliament, as you could receive votes from anywhere in the country, not having to convince people in a geographical location. The new voting system also created the need for parties to form coalitions with each other to form the executive. This means that if a party does not get over half of the seats in parliament, at least 61 out of the 120 seats, they would need to get support from other parties to add their strength together to make up the majority together. All the polls indicated that neither the Labour nor National would receive a majority and it would be up to very small parties to create a coalition with the larger parties to allow them to govern. Parties such as the Alliance Party, the ACT Party, United Future, the Christian Coalition, Party and many, 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 many more. And obviously the party that we're here to discuss today, the New Zealand First Party. New Zealand First really fleshed out their policies for this election, and to show what their party actually stood for for this election. This included higher benefits for elderly, a crackdown on gangs, and a strong anti-immigration stance. These were all the things that Winston had stood for for his entire time in Parliament, and would continue to fight for throughout his time in public life. So the 1996 election rolled around, and New Zealand First cleaned up. They won 13.35% of the party vote, and also won 6 electorate seats, Winston winning the Tauranga seat, and the New Zealand First Party winning every single Maori electorate in the country. The five New Zealand First MPs that won the Maori electorates were known as the Tight Five, a reference to the five players in a rugby forward pack who do most of the work in a scrum. So the parliament breakdown looked like this. National with 44 seats, Labour with 37, New Zealand First with 17, Alliance with 13, ACT with 8, and Peter Dunn's United Future Party with 1. This was a huge upset, New Zealand First being the first party that wasn't National or Labour to get such a large share of the seat count. With no party in the majority, it was up to the smaller parties to choose who the government was, but with Alliance refusing to form a coalition with National, the ACT Party refusing to have a coalition with Labour, and the United Future Party being too small to affect any changes in coalition building, New Zealand First had the advantage. Voters delivered New Zealand First 17 MPs and the power to put either Labour or National in government. Winston Peters' debut as the King or Queenmaker. This 1996 election was the first instance of Winston Peters being the Kingmaker of New Zealand, being able to decide whether Jim Bulgers or Helen Clark would be the Prime Minister. It was expected at the time, due to Winston's past issues with the National Party, that New Zealand First would probably crown Helen Clark as the Prime Minister. After months of closed door negotiations with the two parties, negotiations that Winston actually got into a lot of hot water over from the public for basically holding the government hostage for so long. We made it, uh, good progress. No well, I hope I can make the same rules. We'll meet again. Did you, you make any progress on that? I think it's a question of adjusting expectations. No comment on that either. Yeah. Yeah. Can you give us a date to the negotiating timetable? Yeah, the point now. I'm not making any comment. Free for all that could put the economy at risk. Well, do you want to have things done responsibly? Well, you were the politician who said there'd be no deals in smoke-filled rooms, Mr Peter. For eight and a half weeks after the election on October the 12th, Wellington was in a state of limbo. Political party leaders came and went. Journalists besieged them for answers. As we go to make this decision, we're in a no-win situation. We're going to disappoint a great number of our supporters, our party members, and a significant proportion of the public of this country. We're in a unique position. We are the people who are going to decide the next government. No New Zealanders have ever been in that circumstance like we have before. Our responsibility is to do what's right for the country. Uh, but ideally, in an ideal world, we, we wouldn't be dealing with either Labour or National because they were the reasons why this party was founded. But in the real world, we had to find a government for the people of, this, of New Zealand that there would be disappointment and vitriol and bitterness and criticism, all of which has emerged. Ignore all that and do your duty. 
Winston Peters made a shock announcement that he would in fact prop up the National Party in the first MMP election and crown Jim Bolgers as the Prime Minister. But it became clear that Winston Peters made a lot of demands to the National Party for them forming a coalition with them. The most notable concession made to Winston Peters was the fact that he became the Deputy Prime Minister, technically the second most powerful job in government. What would happen in the event that you cease to be Prime Minister? How is your replacement selected? Is it automatically the Deputy Prime Minister or is it automatically the next leader of the National Party? Oh, next leader of the National Party. I mean, the next leader of the National Party as the largest party in the coalition uh, would almost certainly be the Prime Minister. You note the document says that the leader of the New Zealand First Party will, shall be, in fact, the Deputy Prime Minister. So I don't think there's any real debate in that area. Uh, that's something for the future, and I'm not planning to go, so we needn't worry about it. Winston Peters also demanded that the powers given to the Finance Minister would be split between the Finance Minister and a position called the Treasurer. The Treasurer was a new position made up out of these negotiations, a position that had seniority over the Finance Minister, a position that Winston Peters gave to himself, a position that would make him Ruth Richardson's boss. Remember her? She's the one that said Winston Peters wouldn't be able to make a successful party. Who's laughing now? Many other New Zealand MPs were given high-profile positions in cabinet, such as Tua Hanari, who became the Minister of Maori Affairs. Winston was out on top, seeming to get everything he could have wanted, essentially forcing his way into the leadership of the national government, making big decisions of what the policy of the country was going to be. Even national MPs went to toast the man they'd last toasted when they kicked him out of their caucus in 1992. Even Mr Bolger would eventually join the party. But Mr Peters would not allow cameras in his office. Only the departing Bellamy's trolleys testified to how jubilant the celebrations were. But the polls showed that New Zealand First voters did not like the fact that Winston Peters had formed a coalition with the National Party. If a coalition delivers up what you've had in the last 12 years, then we New Zealanders will have got ourselves exactly nowhere. RNZ's Marie Hosking was at a post-election rally where the question of which way Mr Peters would go was very much in voters' minds. And at least some of those who braved the rain to turn out were still warning it not to help National back into power. I can see him leaning uh, one way, which I hope he doesn't, but I'm not saying which way it is. We can see him leading towards National. Everyone thinks that too. He should be going with what he said. He said he would never, ever go into government with Bolger, Birch or Shipley. He told us that, so why doesn't he stick to his guns? And the New Zealand people did not like the fact that the New Zealand First Party was asserting so much control over the government when they only got 13% of the vote. It seemed like National's MPs did not like this fact as well. And in 1997, while Prime Minister Bolgers was overseas, ambitious National MP Jenny Shipley staged a party coup and convinced enough National MPs that she should be the Prime Minister, not Bolgers. When Bolgers returned to the country, he realised that he did not have the support of Cabinet and stepped down as Prime Minister, allowing Shipley to become the first female Prime Minister of New Zealand. These party shenanigans are not new to New Zealand, and we see it every so often, as the voters do not vote directly for Prime Minister, but vote for parties to decide who the Prime Minister is going to be. Now Shipley was not going to roll over for Winston, and after a public squabble about the privatisation of Wellington Airport, Shipley sacked Winston from Cabinet, taking away all of his ministerial positions. Winston could have been Prime Minister for, about for want of himself. His complexity uh, often got ahead of his capability, and um, Watching him, oh, look, on a good day, he was brilliant. Most, he was um, a sort of an 85% outstanding leader. And the 15% absolutely crippled him. Now, under notice to the public, Winston told his party that he intended to break up the coalition deal with National and force a re-election, and possibly let Labour form the government instead. This sparked a rift between the party, and Deputy Leader and Type 5 member Tua Haneri challenged Winston Peters for leadership of the New Zealand First Party. Winston won this private leadership challenge, holding on to control of his party. This infighting would not be made public for many years. Winston publicly stated that New Zealand First would break up coalition ties with National and call a vote of no confidence on the National government. But Tua Hanari gathered up support within the New Zealand First Party and eight of New Zealand First MPs left the party and became independent MPs. Enough parties including the ACT Party, United Future and the new independent MPs propped up the national government and allowed Jenny Shipley to finish her term as Prime Minister while Winston Peters was pushed into opposition, no longer in government. The 1990 election came around and New Zealand First was polling abysmally, even getting low as 2% in some polls. But on election day, New Zealand First received 4.25% of the vote. Usually this would result in them getting no seats in Parliament, as there is a 
the threshold under MMP for your party vote. So if you don't get over the 5%, all your votes will be thrown out. But due to the now controversial coattailing rule, a party can forego the 5% threshold if they win at least one electorate seat, which New Zealand First did through the Tauranga electorate. Winston only just won that electorate too, with Winston Peters losing a lot of his support and only winning by 63 votes. And people say that your vote doesn't count. This allowed New Zealand First to hold on to five seats in parliament. Maori Pacific, a new party created by Tua Haneri and other former NZ First MPs, had a terrible finish on 0.19% of the vote, losing all their electorates and getting no seats in parliament. This would not be the last time we see Tua Haneri, who later joined the National Party. But after just one term, Labour had ousted the Type 5, taking back all of the Maori electorates. A coalition was formed between the Labour Party, the Alliance Party, and the Green Party, crowning Helen Clark as the Prime Minister, the first elected female Prime Minister of New Zealand. It seemed like Winston was against the ropes, having only five MPs in his party, and not even being considered as a coalition partner. But he would be back. In opposition, Winston was very vocal for his policies as usual, but mainly focusing on the party's two main policies, more benefits for elderly and less immigration. Winston was a big protectionist when it came to immigration. Some have even called him xenophobic. I Bring in half the refugees who are carrying HIV and all sorts of third world diseases. We can't help a New Zealander, but we can help every Tom, Dick and Harry, Mushtag and Ben Laden. As they say in Beijing, Two wongs don't make a white. Are you a racist bigot? Well, of course I'm not. But as he was in opposition, he didn't really get much of substance done, just being a vehicle to criticise and question the Labour government. And his public support seemed to rise yet again, even polling with comparable numbers to New Zealand First's 1996 popularity. Now, during this time, the coalition government in charge made many left-wing changes, such as superannuation changes, increase in the minimum wage, and introducing interest-free student loans. But in comparison to the previous Labour government that was led by David Longy, it looked like to be more of a centrist and incremental approach to governance, similar to what you saw in America and the UK around the same time. This created a rift between the Labour Party and their coalition partners. Some more radical members of the Alliance Party and the Green Party were trying to push for more left-wing changes. This forced Helen Clark to call an early snap election in 2002, several months before it was supposed to be scheduled. Labour was polling well though, and Nationals still hadn't found their footing since ditching Bulges, and the 2002 election results looked as follows. Labour with 52 seats, National with 27, the worst showing that their party has ever had, New Zealand First bouncing back with 13 seats, Act with 9, the Greens with 9, United Future with a surprising 8 seats, and the Progressive party, a new party formed out of the wreckage of the Alliance Party, with two seats. Unfortunately for New Zealand First, however, Labour chose to form a coalition with the Progressive Party and the United Future Party. This left Winston in opposition again, as Labour explicitly ruled out forming a coalition with New Zealand First before any votes had been cast. For three years, Winston bid his time in opposition, pushing his agenda, criticising all people that were not in his party. Before the 2005 election, Winston stated that he had not decided which party he would want to support, stating that he would not seek the baubles of office, as he called them, claiming that he cared only for his party's policies and did not desire to be the deputy prime minister again or receive any cabinet positions. Our policies deserve to be debated in this campaign and now the voters know that New Zealand First will not be in government by our own choice. They also deserve to know that we intend to serve New Zealanders, as we always have, by keeping the government honest, and to keep it from pandering to the extreme left or the extreme right, and from within. It involves, for my colleagues, a real sacrifice, but we willingly make it. For my part, I never took as Deputy Prime Minister ministerial cars or a house, so we generally don't care about the baubles of office. We in New Zealand First are going to put New Zealanders first. As the election drew near, National rose in the poll with their new party leader, Don Brash. This seemed to draw support away from New Zealand First Party, who seemed to be getting less and less popular. The race in Tauranga also got much tighter as Winston's national challenger, Bob Clarkson, started to top opinion polls in that region. So the election rolled around and it was a very close election. Labour had 50 seats, National had 48, New Zealand First had dropped down to 7, Greens had 6, the newly formed Maori Party had won 4 of the Maori electorates and got 4 seats, United Future had 3 seats, ACT had 2 seats and the Progressive Party had 1. So many parties in Parliament, the most we've ever seen in New Zealand history. But through various agreements, coalitions and the like, Labour held on to government with support of New Zealand First, United Future, the Greens, and the Progressive Party. As part of concessions given by Labour for their support, Winston became the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Racing, completely contradicting his promise to stay in the opposition and to not receive baubles of office. Another big thing of note about this election is the fact that Winston lost his towering seat to National with Bob Clarkson by a good 700 votes. But Winston was not having that, and he does what he does best and took Clarkson to court. Okay. Put, 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 put. Claiming that National broke election rules and spent too much money on the campaign in their electorate, but the case was thrown out, stating there was no evidence for the over-expenditure in Tauranga, and Winston never won Tauranga again. 
A side note on this, in 2005, there was a huge scandal where it was found by the Auditor General that every single party that won seats except the Progressive Party had broken campaign finance law in the 2005 election. This is because New Zealand has very strict campaign finance law and how parties are meant to be transparent and file their donations and expenses properly, but we also have very poor enforcement for these rules, and it usually ends up with lots of rule breaking. The main punishment is usually just a decline in public popularity, as it makes them look corrupt, but not many official punishments. It turns out that New Zealand First was the second largest break of this role, misspending over $150,000. A post and national who Winston had taken to court over a very similar matter who'd only overspent $11,000. Oh dear. But in a twist of events, New Zealand First was the only party that never repaid the money, and this would not be the first time that Winston would be in hot water over campaign finance law. The Tauranga electorate loss was very substantial, because Tauranga had been the reason New Zealand First was able to keep their seats in the 1999 election, through the coattailing rule. And this time around, New Zealand First got dangerously close to falling below the 5% threshold, only receiving 5.72% of the party vote. They almost didn't make the cut, but they did make the cut, and Winston took over his ministerial positions. This was actually a very productive election cycle for Winston Peters and New Zealand First policies. The biggest thing I would say is the fact that they passed New Zealand First's signature Super Gold Card policy, which was a sort of identification card for people who are aged 65 and over to receive extra benefits, most notably free travel for pensioners on public transport during off-peak times, as well as discounts at various businesses across the country. This was a big initiative, as pensioners were basically the biggest voting base for New Zealand First, really giving back to the people who put them into Parliament for so many years. Another massive thing Winston did was act as a UN negotiator to try to decrease tensions between North Korea and the world. No, seriously. In 2006, North Korea began nuclear testing in hopes to create a working bomb, which scared the pants off everyone in the world. But it is so hypocritical for the USA, the only country to ever use a nuclear weapon, to lecture a sovereign country about nuclear weapons. So the world turned to New Zealand, a country who took a strong and international stance against nuclear technology in the 70s. Winston Peters, the foreign minister of New Zealand, even went to North Korea, one of the only Westerners to ever do this, to try to find a middle ground to reach a deal to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Even though this attempt was unsuccessful, it would be dishonest to say that he did not play an important role in these diplomatic efforts, as ties with the world did open up slightly more with North Korea after Winston's talks, and apparently Winston negotiated a shipment of native birds to be sent to New Zealand from North Korea as well. What a random thing. In late 2006, there was a rising star in the National Party, John Key, who became the leader of the party and shot up in the polls. Key was very popular, being seen as very centrist and actually pretty liberal on some social issues, in stark contrast to previous national leaders who had been quite socially conservative. John Key found an enemy in Winston. St. Peters, who constantly berated him in Parliament, stating that he would be a terrible choice to vote for in the 2008 election. Just months before the election, there was a scandal. New Zealand First and Winston Peters were under investigation by the Serious Fraud Office for another donation scandal, this time including some very big names in New Zealand's wealthy class, donations from people such as Owen Glenn and Bob Jones. When questioned about the scandal in Parliament, Winston denied knowing anything about the donations being received by his party, and famously held up a no sign every time he was asked about it. This sign was actually sold for charity years later to raise funds for the Christchurch earthquakes. This investigation made New Zealand First look very corrupt and made them very unpopular, and Helen Clark dismissed Winston Peters from his ministerial positions. Yet again, Winston could not finish an election cycle without being fired by the Prime Minister. The appropriate thing is for him to stand aside from his portfolios while the Serious Fraud Office conducts its investigation. John Key took this opportunity to kick Winston while he was down and declared that New Zealand First could not be trusted and they would not be considered as a coalition partner by National. Through the final conclusion, which was really, if I couldn't trust Winston Peters, then I couldn't have him in the cabinet. And that was going to really essentially cease the relationship between New Zealand First and National. So the election came around and Winston was out. And I don't mean out of government, I mean entirely out of Parliament. New Zealand First only received 4% of the party vote. And with Winston losing the towering electorate again, this time by a huge margin, to the new ambitious political upcomer, National Simon Bridges. Winston was out and National was in, with John Key being crowned as a Prime Minister, with coalition deals with the ACT Party, United Future and the Maori Party. And this is where the story finishes. Forgotten by New Zealand, he barely showed up in the polling data and seemed to have evaporated into irrelevance, only being discussed in Parliament as a bit of a joke by the new Prime Minister. Winston Peters, as a senior member, he sat back and did nothing. Speaking of the new Prime Minister, John Key had become pretty popular, National almost receiving a majority in the 2008 election, only having to work with a few small parties to pass legislation. Just before the 2011 election, John Key was seen having tea with the ACT Party leader John Banks. This was seen as a way to indicate to Epsom voters to vote for the ACT Party in the Epsom electorate to keep that party afloat, as that party will probably not hit the 5% threshold. This is a tactic that National has used in the past, just like how they kept Peter Dunn afloat in the Ohio electorate. Wouldn't it be a shame if a member of the media had bugged the meeting between Key and 
and Banks, so New Zealand could have heard what went on in that meeting. Well, that's exactly what happened, and it wasn't pretty. John Key was not only openly describing his voting scheme to prop up the ACT Party in Epsom as a way to keep control in government, but he was very blunt, telling John Banks how to run his party. Being a sort of puppet master over the ACT Party, he also said some very unflattering things about elderly people in passing, which was not a good look. This comes as allegations surface that John Key made a derogatory comment about elderly people in the conversation. Many voters took offence to these tapes, and as if John Key had said his name three times, Winston Peters emerged from political exile, and he threw his hat into the ring to run for parliament again. <laughs> That's what you're going to hear in these tapes. What some young turkey thinks of your efforts. In a remarkable turnaround, Peters clambered out of the political wilderness. This country has gone from greatness to mediocrity in just one generation under the leadership of National and Labour. Our policies and commitment comprise the only hope for New Zealand to become great again. Like many people have pointed out before, there are so many similarities between Winston Peters and Donald Trump. But this is kind of crazy. A right-wing populist outsider who has a lot of support from elderly people with policies about low immigration, has meetings in North Korea, and both use the term great again in reference to their country, the parallels are uncanny. Anyway, back to the 2011 election. Basically showed the resurrection of a dead party, New Zealand First resurging and getting 6.6% of the vote. Even though Winston was back, bringing eight New Zealand First MPs with him, he was not needed to form a government. Like in 2008, John Key had ruled out even considering a coalition with New Zealand First. I want to lead a positive aspirational government and I don't believe a Winston Peters uh, government does that. If Winston Peters holds the balance of power, it will be a full golf led uh, Labour government. Um, historically, he's always been sacked by Prime Ministers. And I'm about tomorrow, I'm not about yesterday. But this was fine with Winston. He was okay to stay in the opposition and to keep the government honest. But as usual, New Zealand First couldn't go too long without a scandal. It turned out that in 2012, New Zealand First MP Brendan Horan was accused of stealing money from his dying mother. This caused a large outrage in the press, and Winston refused to comment. Brendan Horan was notable, as he had been chosen to run in Winston's former electorate, Tauranga, instead of Winston. He didn't win that seat though, but in December the media frenzy was too much, and Winston fired Horan from his party, making Horan an independent MP. MP. Brendan Horan became a bit of a nuisance for his former party, calling for hearings and investigations into the inner workings of the New Zealand First Party. Nothing illegal had been found, but it was very embarrassing for them. Now before we get to the 2014 election, I want to discuss, in my opinion, one of the most important social changes that happened under the John Key government. The passing of the Marriage Amendment Bill in 2013, that made same-sex marriage legal in New Zealand. This was a milestone for New Zealand, being a massive change to the country. And guess what? Every single member of the New Zealand First Party, including Brendan Horan, voted against it. Now, I'm not going to call Winston Peters a homophobe for voting against this bill, even though he also voted against the Homosexual Law Reform Act in 1986, way back in the day, in hopes to keep homosexual sex a criminal act in New Zealand. But as I said, I'm not going to call Peters names, I'll allow his former deputy leader to do that. Then, who decides it should be a referee? Him? I hope not, Mr. Speaker. I hope not, Mr. Speaker, because we'd still be in the 1880s, Mr. Speaker. I feel sad that I was. I feel sad that I was a member and even as deputy leader of that man, Mr. Speaker. I think Winston Peters is on the wrong side of history in this regard, and this type of handbrake policies, Winston standing in front of social and economic reform, would become his legacy in the coming years of his political life. Gone were the days of him being a cheeky, smart-talking man of the people. It really seemed to me, and many people, that he was the man in Parliament doing his best to hold everyone back, as Tua Hanari put it. I used to look up to him, but I tell you what, hey, that speech tonight is nothing more than pandering to the 10% on either side of this argument, Mr. Speaker. Nothing more pandering to those racist, redneck people that just love to get on the email. But the 2014 election rolled around and John Key was not so adamant that he wouldn't work with Winston Peters this time around. I think partly it reflects that uh, the country doesn't want to see Labour and the Greens in office. And so if it means uh, having to deal with New Zealand first, 
uh, a lot of our supporters, I think, would prefer to see that situation. It seemed that the far-right Conservative Party might get 5% in this election. They would pull the national government to the right if they were needed in support by the National Party to keep the National Party afloat. But Winston kept his cards close to his chest, not outright saying that he wouldn't go with the National or outright saying that he would go with them either. Winston had heavily criticised National's policies, such as the sale of government assets, even saying that he would force the government to buy the assets back if given the chance. We intend to take back those shares at no greater price than they bought them for. And we will not be making the wishes very clear to Mr. Key, who governs for the few and very few. But we would never know, as the results came out and the Conservative Party did not make it into power, with National almost getting an outright majority and would not need Winston. But New Zealand First increased to 11 seats now, becoming a very powerful opposition party. Just months after the 2014 election, a scandal came out that a National MP, Mike Sabian, was under investigation by police for assault. These were serious accusations, especially since the Prime Minister had made it clear that he'd be considering Sabian for a position within his cabinet. In January 2015, Sabian resigned from Parliament, leaving his Northland electorate seat open for a by-election to take place in the next few months. Now before this by-election, National held 60 out of the 121 seats in Parliament, so all they needed was a vote from the ACT Party or the United Future Party to pass legislation, ACT being to the the right of National and United Future being on National's left. If they lost this Northland electorate seat, they would need both parties to agree to pass laws or depend on the support of the Maori Party who were not as dependable to pass legislation. But not to worry, Northland was a safe National seat since the inception of the electorate. Who could possibly beat them in that by-election? Kia ora, good evening. Just over a day to go and National's heading for a shock loss in the Northland by-election. That's according to our last One News comma, Brunton Poll, before the vote. It shows Winston Peters way out in front. This by-election in March of 2015 was very exciting and gruelling, especially since Labour and the Greens both endorsed Winston Peters for the seat, as it would be a big blow to the National Party. The polls actually showed it being a very tight race between Winston and National, as Winston not only got his usual support, but also support from left-wing people as well. What you've really got happening in Northland is a drag race between kind of the old sort of um, informal coalition, Labour, the Greens, New Zealand First uh, versus National, and uh, that makes the race a bit more interesting and it's obviously going to make it tighter, uh, because instead of um, us versus Winston Peters, which would be pretty straightforward, I would have thought. It's now us versus you know three or four political parties ganging up. This is a chance to kneecap the John Key government. And drum roll, please. Winston Peters won the election. This was unexpected and unprecedented, and it completely took the wind at our national sales, who really needed that seat to confidently pass their agenda. And Winston's first day back in Parliament after winning the seat was just priceless. The Right Honourable Winston Peters. Order, 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 order. Right on all Winston Peters, question number 11. Boo. <laughs> this question is to the Prime Minister and asks, does he stand by all his statements regarding the Northland by-election? This gave New Zealand First an extra seat in Parliament, bringing up their total to 12 seats in Parliament. A big initiative that John Key's government did at this time was attempt to change the flag in New Zealand. There was two referendums set to firstly choose an alternative design and secondly to decide if we should change the flag at all. And right opposed to this was our boy Winston Peters. He was a staunch supporter of the historical New Zealand flag and even said that if it was too similar to Australia's flag that it was up to Australia to change theirs. This flag debate got so heated that Winston Peters even took some councils to court over them flying the alternative flag on public land. I'm really annoyed actually that the alternative is up on the Harbour Bridge that it's been elevated to that status. Well, because it's a breach of the constitution and our laws for a start. You've got the Tauranga City Council talking about running on a flagpole down there and a lawyer saying to them, oh no you don't. Ultimately, the flag referendum failed and New Zealand kept the old flag. In late 2016, Prime Minister John Key resigned as Prime Minister and gave his position over to his deputy, Bill English, who took over as Prime Minister. At this time, National looked like they were going to sail to easy re-election, with Labour doing pretty poor in the polls. But just months before the election, the Labour leader, Andrew Little, resigned as leader, letting Jacinda Ardern take over the party. For just this brief time that she was leader, the Labour Party skyrocketed in the polls, looking to be neck and neck with National for the top position. This was music to Winston's ears. This could mean that he would be once again be the deciding vote, once again being the kingmaker. There was even speculation that Winston would use his kingmaker leverage to crown himself as Prime Minister. Do you want to be Prime Minister? You know, I have never run for any job apart from being an MP in my whole career. 
but both leaders of National and Labour said that was ridiculous. Winston took this opportunity to separate himself from the other small parties. Usually in New Zealand we have debates with the leaders of the two big parties and separate debates for the smaller parties, as we understand that either Bill English or Jacinda Ardern will be the Prime Minister, whereas the leaders of the other parties are only there as support partners through coalitions. Well it seems that Winston didn't think he belonged in the multi-party debate and refused to show up. And yes, New Zealand First leader Winston Peters has pulled out. This showed that he considered New Zealand First to be a unique power broker, not comparable with these other small parties. But in normal New Zealand First fashion, there was a new scandal just before the election. Documents had been leaked that showed Winston Peters had been overpaid for superannuation payments, as he lived with his partner, meaning he should receive less for a super than he was receiving for years. Winston repaid the amount straight away, but it was a big embarrassment for him and his party, and Winston was looking for the one responsible. He blamed Paul Bennett, the deputy leader of the National Party, claiming National tried to destroy his reputation by leaking his personal information, and actually took Paul Bennett to court over it. Can you believe it? Winston Peters taking someone to court. Ridiculous. So the election rolled around, and it was so tight. National had the most seats with 56, Labour with 46, an increase of almost 12% from their vote in 2014. New Zealand First had 9 seats, the Greens had 8, and ACT had just 1. New Zealand First did not win any electorates, not even Northland, which Winston Peters was defending. Even from election night, it was obvious that Winston was going to be the kingmaker once again, and New Zealand First would be needed for any coalition to be formed, be it with National, or with Labour and the Greens together. This led to over a month of closed door negotiations between the three parties, reminiscent of the negotiations Winston Peters did back in 1996, before forming a coalition with Jim Bolger. The most likely outcome, however, would be that Winston Peters would prop up the National Party, as Winston despised the Green Party, and a coalition with Labour would force him to go with the Greens as well, as Labour and New Zealand First did not have enough seats between them to go with each other. But on the 19th of October, he made an announcement. We had a choice to make, whether it was either with National or Labour, for a modified status quo or for change. In our negotiations, both National and Labour were presented with that opportunity, working together, cooperating together for New Zealand. That's why in the end we chose a coalition government of New Zealand first with the New Zealand Labour Party. Winston didn't even tell Jacinda Ardern before the press conference that he had decided to make her Prime Minister. Now that is ballsy. This coalition came with many cabinet positions for New Zealand First. Get ready, this list of positions is rather long. Winston Peters was appointed Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of State-Owned Enterprises, and Minister of Racing. New Zealand First Deputy, Ron Mart, was given Minister of Defence and the Veterans Portfolios. Tracy Martin was given Children, International Affairs, and Senior Citizens Portfolios, as well as being made Associate Minister of Education. Shane Jones was made Minister of Forestry, Infrastructure, Regional Economic Development, and Associate Minister of Finance, and Transport. This seemed like Winston Peters had been blinded by the baubles of office yet again, claiming top positions for him and his party, holding the country hostage even though he only received 7% of the vote. Another big surprise from this time was Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern announced that she was pregnant and that she would give birth while holding the office, the first time in New Zealand history and only the second time a world leader has ever done that. This meant that while Ardern was on maternity leave, Winston Peters would take over as acting Prime Minister for six weeks, running the day-to-day -day of the country. Now this didn't give Winston extra power to pass laws or declare war or anything like that. It did seem to be the peak that Winston Peters' entire career was leading up to. Prime Minister Winston Peters, the largest office bauble. Winston Peters looks like he was really enjoying the role as acting Prime Minister, don't you think? I think he had the time of his life. There's no question this is a guy who um, his entire life has coveted being Prime Minister, he loves being the centre of attention. Jacinda came back six weeks later and took back her position, but Winston was still very influential for the three years of coalition government. Any Labour Party policy would need his approval, as Labour and the Greens did not have the numbers, so he did see this concept of Winston Peters playing the role as a handbrake, from his perspective stopping New Zealand from going too far to the left. It would be unfair to say that he acted as a brick wall though, and did work relatively well with Labour to pass many laws over this period, such as the one year free university policy, multiple minimum wage increases, and an increase in expenditure for benefits and mental health. Winston also got lots of his party's policies through as well, such as forcing many social bills, such as the Euthanasia Bill and the Marijuana Legalization Bill, to be passed only through referendums, instead of them being passed into law without public consent, and also creating a regional growth fund, essentially a slush fund, to buy votes from regional areas. Another big thing that he passed, that I've talked about in a separate video, is the passing of his signature Walker Jumping Bill, which barred MPs from changing parties after they were elected and taking their seats with them. 
This seemed to be a way to stop future events that had plagued the New Zealand party in the past, such as the split from Moray Pacific and the scandal with Brendan Horan back in 2012. He did block many Labour and Green policies though, making New Zealand First unpopular from lefties, as well as unpopular from right-wing people as well, who had wished he'd made Billinger to the Prime Minister instead, and New Zealand First started slipping in the polls. It was actually showing that even though Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern was very popular, in the next election, National Act would be able to beat them, and with New Zealand First losing all of their seats. This was the state of the polls in 2019, which did not make the Labour-led government happy. So the next election will be in late 2020. And you know what else happened in 2020? Cabinet met today and agreed that effective immediately, we will move to alert level three nationwide. After 48 hours, the time required to ensure essential services are in place we will move to level four. Jacinda Ardern's popularity exploded due to a handling of COVID in New Zealand, with national falling into basic irrelevancy, and it looked like Labour might be able to form a government alone in 2020, something that had never happened before under MMP. This change in the polls seemed to be a rally around the flag effect, as Labour received a lot of credit for their handling of the pandemic. New Zealand First was still doing terrible in the polls, never really resurging since forming a coalition with Labour. So even though Labour got a lot more popular, the voters did not really thank Winston for propping her up in the first place. With COVID restrictions, campaigning was a nightmare, with social distancing and other campaign limitations. Winston even said that it was the worst election campaign he had ever been a part of, and he would know, he's been in politics for decades. And as per usual, there was a scandal involving the serious fraud office investigating a foundation called the New Zealand First Foundation, investigations that include mishandling of over a half a million dollars of donation money that Winston Peters said had nothing to do with the election or the main party. Two people have been charged with fraud from the scandal, but these people were not New Zealand first ministers, candidates, or even members of the party. But this scandal damaged the party in the polls even more, and Winston accused the serious fraud office of using this investigation as political sabotage, comparing it to James Comey investigating Hillary Clinton in the US 2016 election. With these poor numbers, Winston had to find a way to improve his party's image. He even showed up at the multi-party debates this time, showing how even he recognized his decline in popularity, and tried to distance himself from Labour and the Greens, trying to reposition his party as an opposition party. But it just didn't work, so the 2020 election came around, Labour got an unprecedented 65 seats. National had 33, the Greens had 10, ACT had 10, and the Maori Party had 2. New Zealand First was out. They only received 2.6% of the vote. New Zealand First was out of Parliament. On election night, Winston Peters gave us a very cryptic speech, where he did not give us his official resignation from the party like we were all expecting. To those who have been successful tonight, our congratulations and best wishes. For 27 years, there's been one party that's been prepared to question the establishment and challenge authority. And tonight, more than ever, that force is still needed. For, for in any challenge, it is the preparedness to stand up and take on the challenge, win or lose, that really matters. And as for the next challenge, we'll all have to wait and see. <laughs> God bless you and God bless New Zealand. Thank you very much. Winston was 75 years old at the time of this loss. A resignation would have been expected, as he is not likely to resurge again at age 78. But I guess that's what people said in 2008, after his big defeat last time round. Everyone wrote off this man countless times, and he always returned, kicking and cursing. Winston is a legend, and even his political enemies can recognise what a big event it is to have Winston out of Parliament. Take it from his political enemy and former friend and colleague, Tua Hinari. What are your thoughts to, to reflect tonight? Because oh. it's a big deal, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and I, and I, and I think... You know, say what you're all about, um, WP, Winston Peters. Um, he's the one that gave me my shot. So first off, thank you, Winston. Secondly, this guy's been in Parliament for nearly 40 years. And let that just sink in for a little bit. Longer than the Prime Minister's been alive. <laughs> that's, that's right. I met Winston when I was 18. I just turned 60. And he was an MP when I was 18. Um, you know, 10, 13 years before even I became an MP. Um, this guy needs and deserves, I, I believe, deserves a gong. He'll never uh, take it. Well, he, he may not take it. Um, oh, Sir Winston should, Peters has a certain ring to it, he doesn't should it? Be, he should be um, offered it, you know, regardless of what, it, what we think of him. 
You know, 40 years of a person's life, and he's 70, what, 74? Hey, he's 75. He was born 75. in the last year of the Second World War. He, at 70, and 45. He's 75 years old. That's mm. absolutely amazing. And, you know, um, anywhere else in the world, he would be fettered. And in good Winston Peters fashion, there was yet another scandal just as he left office. It was reported that $12,000 of taxpayers' money had spent on a farewell party for Winston Peters after he did not make it into Parliament. This party was attended by over 100 MPs, including the Prime Minister. It was also reported that Winston Peters didn't even want this party to go ahead in the first place, and was kind of bullied into having it. It seems like a bit of a non-story though, the story actually being pushed by the right-wing taxpayers' union. And let's be honest, this type of cost actually seems pretty normal for a celebration like this. And an event like this wouldn't be unusual at a large company, seeing off an employee who would be working for them for 36 years like Winston had. Just seems like a bit of a non-scandal to send Winston off. Winston Peters out of Poland also creates a weird void in New Zealand politics without any parties being in the centre ground or in a position to work with other parties. Even though Winston Peters was brash and polarising, he was a breeder politician that would work across the aisle doing what he thought was right for the country. Now we have two factions of parliament, every day New Zealand becoming more partisan and split down party lines. Winston Peters is still officially the leader of the New Zealand First Party, who is doing terrible in the polls. Poll around 1 or 2 percent and it's unlikely we'll see this party resurging, especially if Winston retires as he is expected to do. But I'll be the first to admit I was wrong if Winston and New Zealand First resurge in 2023, but it's really not that likely. Contrary to what some people might believe, New Zealand First has always been a vehicle for Winston Peters, not really a party all to itself. Without Winston, there is no New Zealand First, and now we're going to see what it's like to have a New Zealand Parliament without Winston Peters.